Earlier today, we heard uh, the story of Cassandra and how she tried to warn of the dangers ahead and was ignored, resulting in disaster. And the Northwest Indian Applied Research Institute here at Evergreen has been involved in a project for the last six years, which takes us as premise that indigenous peoples are the Cassandra of our age, that they have been the first nations that have been the first affected by the effects of climate change, people who have been harvesting for many centuries in the same places and have intimate knowledge of those places, have been trying to warn us for many, many years of the changes that are happening out there, and they have not been listened to. Why is it that we know more about the polar bears in the Arctic than about the Inuit people who live next to the polar bears who are seeing their villages fall into the ocean because of permafrost melting and coastal erosion. So we set up the Climate Change and Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Project here at Evergreen, inspired by Tulalip Tribe's uh, leader, uh, uh, Terry Williams, a uh, Maori environmental scientist from New Zealand. And we <coughs> issued a report to Indigenous leadership in the Pacific Northwest, British Columbia, Alaska, and New Zealand, and also a community organizing booklet to translate some of the technical and legal language around climate change into basic accessible English for a community audience. We started with the uh, idea that native peoples are the miner's canary of climate change. And you hear that a lot, the idea that a miner takes a canary down into the coal mine and the canary succumbs to poison gas, and you can see uh, that there are dangers uh, implicit. Indigenous peoples are like the miner's canary when their cultures and languages disappear. This reflects the profound sickness in the ecology. The problem that indigenous peoples have brought up with this model is that at the end, the canary dies. And so we prefer a different analogy, and that is one where the canary escapes from the cage <laughs> and leads the hapless miner to safety away from the poison gas. Dan Wildcat in his book Red Alert says much the same thing. You might be the miners, but we are not canaries. <laughs> so really how we're approaching this work now is what can non-native communities learn from indigenous communities about resilience, about meeting the challenge of climate change, the mitigation and the adaptation. So the idea of resilience, the power or ability to return to the original form, drawing on traditional culture from the past, but also how to adapt to modern conditions, to modern technologies, um, elasticity, buoyancy. But I prefer the visual definition of resilience in the tribal canoe journey, the cultural resurgence among tribal youth that we see in this region, and who are actually involved themselves while they're paddling and gathering data on water quality in the, in the Sailor Sea and how it's changing year to year. So we see three forms of resilience. One is in traditional ecological knowledge, what Greg Cajete calls native science, place-based knowledge, time-tested knowledge, intimate knowledge of the landscape, of the resources, that the harvesters' observations, not their deaths as cultures, but their observations, can offer a, an early warning system to what's happening in our region, for instance, the Pacific Northwest, and do so in a quicker way right out there on the front lines than this rather slow process of publishing scientific papers and to integrate together the different things that are happening on the landscape. Second form of resilience is indigenous sovereignty or self-determination. Indigenous peoples and their cultures around the world have survived colonization, epidemics, industrialization, assimilation, boarding schools, pollution, urbanization, and are using those tools of resilience to this day. And that tribal sovereignty, when it's upheld by the federal government as part of its trust responsibility, offers a shield, a place, a testing ground for forms of environmental sustainability, new ways of relating to each other, building community. And in Washington state, of all the 50 states, because the tribes have a seat at the table, 
in co-managing natural resources with the state, we have unique opportunities that are not present in other states to follow the lead of the tribes and what they're trying to do on some of these issues. The third form of resilience is that many indigenous peoples still have a sense of community and draw on that sense of community when a disaster happens, such as a storm uh, opening up the shelters. Um, we heard this uh, from our Maori colleagues from New Zealand, saw it when we brought a class to New Zealand uh, during the recent earthquake. And that kind of tribal sense of community has a real advantage when the food runs out in the grocery stores, when the individualized consumer society that most of us live in is going to be very scary and risky and dangerous and directionless. We'll really have to look towards those forms of building community. Many indigenous communities already have something there to draw on. And those can be models for their non-native neighbors. But there are many challenges to indigenous nations in the Pacific Northwest and around the Pacific Rim. And it's symbolized to me by looking at the spot where the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed in 1854, down on the Nisqually Delta. Um, there was a tree standing there at the time of the treaty signing that survived for many, many, many decades afterwards. This is a photo of it in 1914. This is 2002. And this is after a hurricane force windstorm toppled it in December 2006. So even though the treaty rights are there on paper, nevertheless, climate change, the intensification of these extremes uh, threatens those treaty rights that have been fought for so hard by the native peoples of our region. And we can see in the recession of the glaciers, both in the Cascades and in the Olympics that provide very dramatic visual evidence of the changes in our climate, also provide threats to the fishery, to the shellfish in our region. Because of that declining spring snowpack, um, the, declining, the receding glaciers, less water in the system during many summers, or the spring melt happens in more extreme ways, resulting in floods that scour out the gravel beds where the spawning is taking place and throwing off the timing of ecosystem relationships, a little more subtle, but a hatch of flies that might provide sustenance to the fishery is born at a different time than when the fish can take advantage of it. And all sorts of other threats from ocean acidification, destroying many of the shellfish beds, hypoxia or oxygen starvation off the coast and in the Hood Canal, uh, resulting in dead zones. Um, higher stream water temperatures, as we heard before. The threats from forest fires, endangering resources in the forest, medicinal plants, animals. The damage from beetles um, that are moving northward, that are shifting because of climate change and upslope, um, resulting in more dead vegetation that is easier to, uh, to, to inflame catastrophic wildfires. Shifting species, we had an MES student here at Evergreen uh, interviewing some of the Ho and Quileute harvesters about some of the species that are shifting northward, such as brown pelicans, the Humboldt squid, uh, that, are, uh, that are eating a lot of the salmon. The salmon themself, themselves moving out of some of the treaty-defined territories where the tribes have rights to harvest them and projections showing in the future that they may move northward out of those areas uh, to places where the tribes can't pursue them legally. Sea level rise, and I think we've heard just recently congressional legislation that the Ho and Quileute nations can move to higher ground to get away from the threats of storm surges that have brought huge driftwood logs right next to the school at La Push. Uh, that has re uh, flooding that has resulted in the Ho tribal headquarters being permanently sandbagged. Um, the threat of tsunamis, as we saw in 1964, 2011, um, those will be exacerbated, those threats will be worsened by sea level rise. And the tribes are looking ahead to adaptation to move to higher ground. Now, I think this cartoon sums up some of the opportunities that we see, ironically, in climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. 
Climate change mitigation and adaptation is a great excuse to do a lot of healthy things for our society that we should be doing anyway, anyway and to accelerate the timetable and the political strength behind the argument to make these changes that should happen anyway. And tribes in the US, First Nations in Canada, indigenous peoples are taking this message of resilience and this message of opportunity and moving ahead with it. And especially doing it in cooperation with some of their former adversaries in the local non-native communities that they often have been in battle with over natural resources. A lot of what we're doing is at the local scale. Instead of waiting for the state government, for the federal government, for the United Nations to change and hand down this wonderful bill to mitigate climate change, which should happen, which has to happen as we've, as we've been hearing. We can't wait for that to happen. There are many, many thousands of local solutions that can be stitched, stitched together into a greater whole and provide models, provide directions to people around our region and around the country. And in many ways, the Pacific Northwest is a leader in the United States in many of these positive things that are happening. So the Swinomish tribe is working with some of the local governments in the Skagit River Delta uh, to try and prevent some of the flooding events and uh, getting out of the way of sea level rise and uh, cooperating with some of their former adversaries in local governments. Uh, the Nisqually tribe right here has signed an agreement with Olympia to move the source of fresh water where we get 80% of our water from a low springs, McAllister Springs, that is susceptible to saltwater intrusion from sea level rise and moving it to a well field on higher ground. That's being constructed right now. That kind of thing isn't happening elsewhere in the country, but it's happening right here. Local emergency planning, when the mudslide happens from the major storm and your community is cut off from the rest of the state, from the grocery stores, um, the local non-native community isn't going to have anywhere else to turn to but the local tribal community, as we've seen in some recent storms. FEMA isn't going to ride in and rescue you, as we've seen in Katrina. Local neighbors are going to have to rely on each other and rebuild that sense of community to share the emergency resources. I tell a lot of students, go into emergency planning. Um, we need good people there. We don't need the kind of people that Naomi Klein describes in the shock doctrine as taking advantage of crisis in order to restructure society along their lines. We need people there on the ground to understand that we need more collectivity. We, we need more of a sense of community and we meet, need more environmental sustainability. Adopting renewable energies, tribes producing green energy from wind, from biomass, from other uh, possibilities and selling it to uh, local municipalities, local governments. Uh, the Tulalip tribes have really gone ahead with um, working with some of the dairy farmers that previously they were battling with because the cattle waste was going into the salmon streams. So they came up with a solution of building a biogas plant in Monroe in order to turn that cattle waste into cheaper energy to sell back to the farmers. Um, so this kind of innovative direction, this kind of collaborative direction is really growing with co-management, with the backing of treaty rights here in the Pacific Northwest. This is the kind of thing that I studied in my doctoral dissertation at the University of Wisconsin, as I found out that some of the places where tribes and the local non-native people, farmers, ranchers, fishers, who had had the strongest conflicts with the tribes over natural resources was ironically where it was easiest to develop environmental collaboration, to keep out mines, to keep out uh, damaging uh, projects to the local environment. Exactly the opposite of what you'd think. There are a lot of these kinds of really interesting things happening in rural areas, in particular in our region. Um, the last thing we did in our report was to issue recommendations to look towards the future. And one of the main things we see, even in our own region, that seems to have plenty of rainfall, is the need to secure water sources for tribes to use their federal rights 
uh, to, to claim a portion of the water, enough to survive, enough for the salmon, enough for their economic development. Um, and one of our MES students has actually looked at the Tulalip tribe's proposal to store some of that snow melt, uh, some of the glacial runoff uh, in underground areas and other areas in order to release it during the summer low flows so that the salmon could survive. Um, and some of these very simple things that can be done uh, along with the natural environment. Securing food sources. There's a huge traditional food movement in Indian country. And a lot of these traditional foods are more resilient to drought, to flood. Um, and they can provide trading opportunities among tribes as well. Adapting to new foods, which is a very difficult question because it's not just an economic or material question, but also a cultural question because so much of the tribal identity is based on these iconic species such as salmon. Um, but there is talk among tribes about preparing their relatives to the north for the kind of species that might be headed their way, either ones that they want to harvest or invasive species that they want to avoid. Women uh, who, no, who can no longer find grasses or reeds for baskets, trading with their relatives to the north and trying to acquire some of those through these kind of traditional trading networks. Protecting cultural resources habitat, and I think the Nisqually watershed. The Nisqually tribe has really led the way in trying to heal some of the historic damage to the Nisqually watershed uh, through some of the riparian repair of the tributaries to the Nisqually River. 72% of that river is now in protective uh, ownership. Um, the other thing is to educate the youth to the sensitivity to the natural world. And one of the authors uh, in this anthology that we just published, went to the printer on Friday actually, um, is to try and bring youth to some of these uh, traditional learning camps up in Alaska where they would uh, try and find their way on a beach at night blindfolded to increase their, to un unplug from the electronics and increase their sensitivity to the natural world so they can recognize some of the subtle changes that are taking place in the environment. Finally, um, we really feel that there should be a seat at the table in these international processes for the people who are most vulnerable and most affected by climate change, the indigenous nations that have been left out of the UN processes. Um, and also the work that we've seen across the border among indigenous nations, such as the Coast Salish across the US-Canadian border, um, the, uh, the exchanges with New Zealand uh, that we've seen. And involving indigenous youth uh, is the main goal that we see among the indigenous leadership. Uh, not only getting them to help in planning for the future of their communities, but interviewing the elders, mapping their traditional territories, getting to know the resources in order that they can step into that role. So if uh, I think it can be summed up by Billy Frank Jr., who in the foreword to our new book from Oregon State University Press, Asserting Native Resilience, Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Face the Climate Crisis said, we are all dependent on the health of our ecosystem, whoever we are and whatever we do. Once people understand this, we will be able to join hands in dealing with the environmental challenges that face us. Where we must adapt, we will be able to do so. Where we can help nature to prevent human tragedies that will otherwise occur by curtailing environmental damage, conserving resources, and restoring habitat for fish and wildlife, we will do so together. That's Billy Frank. And this is, if you want to learn more about the project, and I'd like to thank the authors of Asserting Native Resilience, which is coming out in June. Thank you.